So um, welcome. It's it's great to to have you zooming in. So um, so just to to sort of introduce, this is our our guest speaker Maggie Phillips. So she's a freelance writer and fellow journal, journalism fellow at Tablet Magazine. Um, and uh, the I'm I'm uh, sharing this with my students from two courses I'm doing on religion and media. Um, and we've read an article by you for today. Um, the article that you did, A Market for Meditation, on the Halo app. Um, and we were talking about that uh, in, in, in the context of, we've, we've looked at a lot of different things. We've looked at the uh, different ways of viewing media from a sociological or philosophical or theological point of view. Um, mm -hmm. We've looked at the intersections of religion and race in American uh, history and how it's been uh, expressed through media. Um, we've looked at gender and media and religion, all sorts of things. And what we're looking at now is a unit on uh, Catholic approaches to media and how and how it's changed, especially we looked last class at um, how uh, the, the approach of the Catholic Church to media from uh, changed a lot over the 20th century after Vatican II. And so your article is kind of just sort of the next chapter of that, of looking at how ca Catholic practice continues to change in relationship mm -hmm. to media. Um, so yeah, that's just uh, where we're coming from. Um, so I, I have a number of questions that, that I've, I've gotten from students for you, but I wasn't sure if you wanted to say anything first about, um, about yourself or about uh, your work as a, as a writer. Um, just that I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you so much. This is like the perfect class for, <laughs> for what I do. So this is amazing. I, I love hearing about this. Like when I took on this role, it's through a grant through the Arthur, Arthur Binding Davis Foundation. And the specific remit of the grant is to increase religious literacy. Mm -hmm. And so when I started writing for tablet, tablet being a Jewish cultural publication, mm -hmm. me not being Jewish. Um, it was kind of the kind of like in a weird way, a really good fit because I am an outside faith perspective right. already at the magazine. Um, and then in talking to my editor, Wayne Hoffman, who actually had a piece out in the New York Times today about Passover and about his uh, marriage at the same time, um, it's really good. You should, he's awesome. You should look it up. Um, but uh, he was like, okay, religion in the US, which is specifically what I'm focused on. He's like, we have, it can't just be white straight guys, like white straight men, because that's kind of the view in America when we think of religion, right? So we, it's been so fun because we're trying really hard to show the diversity of the faith landscape in this country. And it just, it's a year long grant and it doesn't seem like enough, uh, which is why I was so excited that they wanted to renew because <laughs> the first thing I said when the editor in chief told me they wanted to renew is Wayne and I still have so many more ideas. <laughs> um, so it's it's very yeah. exciting. Um, yeah, but, well, yeah. My, my students have been able to see, I, I've asked them to look through your portfolio. So they've seen really the, the huge diversity of stuff you've been working on uh, from so many different religious traditions, but also um, ethnic groups, language groups, um, and just different experiences looking at, uh, there's just so, there's so much to cover. And I, so I have a lot of questions about all of that. Um, but let me also just say that it's, a, it's really just such a joy to have you here. Maggie is also a good, she's a friend of mine from college, yes. we took Russian together. Um, yes. So just to show that the connections that you make as college students uh, can continue to flourish in yes. all sorts of ways. Yeah, so, that's good full disclosure. Cool. That's why I'm so excited to see. Yeah. Yeah. I don't normally <laughs> do this on every Zoom call. Right. So it's it's great to see, it's also great to see you know what you've been doing in in a, in a more uh, more detail. So and I'm you I'm as sure. well. Yeah. Marjorie saved me because I was really not getting Dante recently. And I think you'll be glad to know that I've now worked my way through Inferno and Purgatorio and I just started Paradiso. Oh, this wow. Week. Congratulations. And that's because of yeah. Marjorie's recommendations. So you have a good teacher here. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Okay. So let me, let me take a look at some of these questions that students gave. So I have a number of questions that one of, that are curious about your background and how you got into this in the first place. So um, I, I think maybe the first question that I have from a student that would be great to hear you talk about is um, what made you want to write about religion in specific? What drew you to, to that topic? Yeah, um, 
so when I started writing for tablet, I was sort of drawn to them just I applied for a journalism fellowship that they had and I'd been doing copywriting I'd been doing what I refer to as kind of light mommy blogging. Um, and I just wanted something more and I saw that they had a journalism fellowship and I really respected um, kind of their rigor and their integrity and their kind of commitment to showing different viewpoints. And I sort of thought, you know, when I applied in my application, I said, you're probably wondering why someone with College of the Holy Cross and their resume is applying <laughs> to work at Tablet. But I thought if Tablet's the kind of place I think it is, they won't have a problem with that. And they did and they didn't. And um, I worked, my mentor through that was the um, editor-in-chief, Alana Newhouse, and I was helping her apply for this grant through the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. And the work that I'd been doing for the magazine was dealing more and more with faith stuff. It was more and more about like Orthodox Jewish schools and shuls that were trying to reopen, about interfaith cooperation on different sort of religious freedom things. And it just is sort of what I found myself gravitating toward and realizing how much I didn't know yeah. <laughs> about religion. And I think with um, any kind of journalism, the best thing is to not know a lot because, <laughs> because you're learning and the idea is you're writing for people who also are learning at the same time. So it's kind mm -hmm. of to my a weird advantage that I have that I was also like many Americans kind of uh, religiously illiterate <laughs> when I, <laughs> and still am, still learning. And, um, it was it was just something that I found there's not as many religious people anymore, but there are a lot of spiritual people is the other thing that I'm finding. And when you tell people that you write about religion, like I've only been to, I, I'm just moved to North Carolina a year ago, so I've only been to my dentist twice, but he remembers me because I'm the religion journalist that came in for a cleaning and was on her way to Tennessee to go write about Amish people. And so um, he remembered me when I came back from my cleaning six months later because, and I was like, well, I was writing about um, whether or not Amish people, like the Supreme Court decision about Amish people and how they don't grade. And instantly the hygienist had an opinion. And um, I thought, you know, like people are hungry for this. They, they wanna yeah. know, they wanna know more. I get so, similar reactions as a, as a religion professor. If you tell sure. anyone, people are like, I have so many opinions, I'm just gonna unload them on you. So yeah, absolutely. yeah. I know that I know that experience for sure. Yes, yeah, um, absolutely. So I think just um, as this is not a student question, but dovetailing on that, since you've mentioned this term religious literacy um, a couple of times, um, and this is something that I'm not 100% sure my students will know exactly what you mean by that. So if you could talk a little bit about this idea of sort of religious literacy, the fact that, um, that as you mentioned, American society can be really religiously illiterate. Um, and maybe if you could also talk about what role you see media maybe having either in perpetuating that or maybe uh, as you're doing, sort of dispelling that, that and uh, educating people. Yeah. That was um, like four questions in one, do whatever you want with that. <laughs> yeah, it's, mm -hmm. where do I start? So um, religious literacy as a concept, is just sort of being familiar with broad strokes, the faith, like the, the wisdom traditions that make up our landscape. Again, I write, my remit is the United States, um, but there, there are a lot of people of goodwill, of deep religious faith, and even some who no longer are of a religious faith, but who grew up in one. And it absolutely colors the way you view the world. And when it colors the way you view the world, it informs the way you interact in your communities, in your relationships, in your politics, for good or ill, for positive or negative, like right. your views on different things are gonna be shaped by that. And we, if we don't know where people are coming from, a good example that I still think about is, I remember reading um, during the George W. Bush administration, the president said, he quoted the New Testament and the thing about how are you supposed to remove the plank from your brother's eye or the speck from your brother's eye when you have a plank sticking out of your own. And the comment that the journalist had made was, uh, this was a humorous remark, like they, they portrayed it as like a humorous off the cuff remark that like, oh, W with his like folksy, like aphorisms. And it was like, you know, that's like from the Bible, right? Like he didn't, 
<laughs> he didn't right. make that up. And I just, that stuck with me. And, um, you know, we look at how many of our conflicts, one of the recent pieces that I wrote was on the Ukrainian Orthodox and Russian Orthodox churches. And we kind of fail to appreciate just how much religion and culture play in that in that dispute. I'm not a military expert. I'm not a geopolitical expert. But I do have something to add as a religion writer, because that's absolutely something that is playing a part in in this conflict, um, whether people realize it or not. So kind of knowing like, not even just the major faith traditions, but the ones that we would consider smaller or maybe not as old, like Monday, I'm going to DC to write about, there's this huge Mormon temple in DC. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's ever driven to DC from Maryland will know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I know it's which one you're talking about, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, East Coast, I-95 corridor people know what I'm talking about. It's massive and you, you can't go inside most of the time. It's not open to visitors, but they recently renovated it. And so they have, they're doing a series of open houses and I'm going for their media day on Monday. Oh, I'm so jealous. I, okay, yeah, no, <laughs> this is like a nerdy thing to be jealous of, but I'm very jealous, but right. yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And so it's, um, well, it's exciting for me because I also spent a lot of time in the DC area and I'm like, yes, like everybody wants to go see what's going on in there. And that to me is kind of religious literacy in a nutshell. You see this thing on the horizon, this sort of foreign thing that you drive by right? like really fast speeds and you know there's an angel on top, you don't know which angel it is or what it means. And um, so opening up that world then to people. And when I get critiques from people from the faith communities that I write about, it's usually all the things that I missed. And I totally get that, I do, I totally get that. I think anyone who belongs to any kind of community that's been portrayed in media knows the feeling of saying, well, they left out this, they left out that, they don't even know about this other thing. And I totally get that. But when you consider that most Americans are religiously illiterate about a lot of faiths, my job is just to kind of open that door for them and say, look, this is the surface level thing. You, you know, I've scratched the surface for you. If you want to know more, you know, now you know where to start, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so no, and I, I, I think that, I mean, hopefully what I, what I hope that students have gotten from this class and, and also from, from your work is that, you know, the religious dimension, understanding religion is just one way in which we can know human beings better, right? We can, it, it's another way that we can understand the world that we live in and the people that we interact with. And it's a crucial dimension. It's not the only one, but it is really important for us to know it better. So I think that's, yeah. that's great. Um, and maybe that relates to, so I have another question from a student asking if you could talk about your uh, experiences as a, as a military spouse. And I wonder if just to connect it to what we're talking about, do you see any, um, connections between, uh, you know, the kinds of intercultural encounters and, and, you know, I know you've lived a very transnational life moving all over the place. Do you see a connection between your life as a military spouse and, and what you're doing in the, in this journalism work? Boy, howdy. Yes, I, <laughs> yes, I do. I do. I think one of the things that surprises people about the military family life is how kind of tolerant it is because we move around so much and, you don't make friends very quickly when you change schools every two to three years if you come in with a lot of very rigid black and white like parameters about who you will and won't hang out with, right? And so you learn so much about people and you learn to just kind of value people and meet people where they are because when you are only someplace for two or three years at a time, you have to know them, get to know them very quickly and um, you form friendships like that. And they, and then you maintain those friendships too. So the one of the things about religion and any kind of journalism is you talk to a lot of strangers. <laughs> you talk to a lot of strangers and you want them to feel like they can trust you and you want them to feel like, um, you know, they're talking about, in many cases, the most important thing in the world to them. And so one of the skills that you hone as a family member in the military is learning to meet people where they're at and finding out what their story is and finding that out very quickly uh, in a meaningful way. The other thing is um, I see a lot of parallels between a lot of religious faiths and just kind of the cultural aspects of military life. I've been working on a piece on um, liturgical cycles in the Christian faith and the idea that a lot of them are agrarian and they're based on the changing of the seasons. And 
they have a lot of rhythms there are a lot of traditions that come out of that there are a lot of practices that come out of that and there are a lot of communal like kind of busy work things like an example someone used with me was uh, shelling peas like there was this guy or shelling peas and he was like this is really not a very efficient way to do this <laughs> like there's a, there's a better way to, to shell peas but he realized that the, it wasn't really about the shelling peas they knew that this was not the best way to do this but it was about the cooperation and the community right. and the relationships that were forged there and um gosh you know in the military there's so many opportunities not just for the service members but for the families for us to come together and work together you know when my husband's deployed I absolutely rely on a community. We watch each other's kids. We and and we know when the not always, but we usually know when those times are coming. We get a calendar, and you know our lives are kind of dictated by that. And for centuries, yes, agrarian stuff was what dictated the seasons. But a military wife recently pointed out to me that um, military. Uh, life was seasonal too for a long time and it still is in many places in the spring you went out to fight that's what you did and the men usually the men for centuries were gone and it was not unusual to have a, a one of you know a partner be gone for months and months at a time with that kind of uncertainty and so you know it kind of just gives you this different filter to understand um kind of where where people are coming from when they've tradition and custom and courtesy and all of those things right. absolutely dictate military life because military life is is uncertain regular life is uncertain and so you really gain an appreciation for ritual and tradition uh when you have that added layer of uncertainty and can appreciate why people value religion for the same reasons absolutely yeah i mean that connects with a lot of the stuff we've done in this class we've looked at ways in which um we can talk about sort of almost religious concepts of, of ritual, of, of the ways that communities relate when we're talking about things that aren't actually religious traditions, whether right. that's like how uh, how celebrity culture works or, or, or the ways that like the ritual of using social media that we can use religious concepts to talk about things that aren't actually religious traditions. And I think, yeah, like that's so, it's so interesting to think about military life as kind of a liturgical season. That's really interesting. I once read an article, I think it was in America magazine, where one of their mm -hmm. reporters went to, I think Guantanamo Bay, but they, they were having a change of command ceremony. And he described, which is when one outgoing commander hands over oh. command to another commander. And it's a very, very scripted thing. Like there is almost a liturgy that's used throughout the entire military. And there's kind of a, there's a ceremony with a narrator and there's banners. Right. And and I mean, it's the whole thing. And he described it as a high liturgy. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is kind of a high it liturgy. Is, yeah. you know? and well, and it shows how important ritual. things, I mean, it shows how important community and ritual and connection are just to human beings in general, that we have that natural desire for it. Absolutely. And people don't, people sometimes don't know that they need mm -hmm. it, you know, like they, we've lost touch with that, I think a lot. I was at the, I was at the gas station and I don't know if they do this where you live, but those screens at the gas station, those like, um, you know, those like little videos where like Maria Menounos comes and tells you about wellness. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, well, it's very there's dystopian. There's some murmurs of assent, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's very dystopian. Um, and so they will have these little videos just kind of like to help you live a better life while you're pumping gas. I don't know. But so Maria Menounos comes on, who used to be on, um, was it like Bravo or something? Anyway, Sounds she right. comes on. Yeah, she comes on E. She was on E. Anyway, she comes on and she's telling you how if you don't like cleaning your house, you can make it more enjoyable by turning it into a ritual and like mm. have a house cleaning ritual. And I'm like, yeah. house? and like, that's fine, like whatever. But I'm like, right, right. There's somebody out there who like legitimately needs Maria Menunos to come on a screen right. on a gas station and teach to them about fill that need that we have for ritual. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, so I have a couple of questions here that relate to you know, what your research process is, how do you choose these stories? What, um, what do you do next? How do you gather research on it? How do you find people to talk to? So I had a number of students curious about that. Yeah, well, it's sometimes it's me pitching my editor. Sometimes it's my editor coming to me about things that I've never even heard of before. I mean, and, and those are some, those are sometimes the most interesting ones because they put me so outside of anything I've ever encountered. I mean, I never saw myself talking to Christian scientists about the COVID vaccine. That was my editor's yeah. idea. 
I have a number um, of student questions about that one too, but we'll get to that. So. Really? Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. I talked to um, Troy Perry, who was the pastor of, yeah, yeah. Did you talk about Troy Perry and his thing? No, I, well, um, we didn't look at that one, but I read it. The one about the MCC, right? The, the LGBT yeah. Christian mm -hmm. church. Yeah. Yes. Metropolitan Community Church. And um, I mean, gosh, he has like this huge legacy of LGBT rights in the U.S. And, you know, it was, that was, an, that was an editor thing, you know, and yeah. it was, it was, you know, so fascinating and so interesting. And you, these things will just fall in my lap sometimes. So sometimes it happens that way. Yeah. Other times it's me saying, you know, I've always wanted, I've always been curious about this thing. Right. And, um, you know, my, my editor, I say like, nothing's too weird for him. He might kind of make me tone it down <laughs> because I have a tendency to get very galaxy brained with things. Yeah. And then he'll be like, eh, maybe not. But um, it was my idea to go to Salem to talk to the witchcraft practitioners yeah. about Samhain. That was, that was another one that students wanted to hear more about. So <laughs> that was like my, that was my favorite one to write. That was, well, cause I got to go to Salem for Halloween, which was mm -hmm. so fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it's just something that I feel like people don't think of when they think about religion. And I think in America, the tendency is like my editor to, said to think of like white, straight Christian men. Right. And my job is to come and say like, no, 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 there's spiritual people all over this country. Right. And religion's so much weirder than you thought. <laughs> and so many of them want the same yeah. things, you right. know, and as a person of faith myself, sometimes I'll talk to people and think like, oh gosh, we're not going to agree on anything. And then I'll come away being like, oh my gosh, we agreed on so much. Not that it matters you know, as a journalist, but just as a person of faith myself to kind of be like, wow, that was really interesting. And I think my hope is that a lot of people will read that and see, you know, in a sort of grandiose, like human way, mm -hmm. we really do kind of want a lot of the same things, you know? Right, right. Absolutely. Well, yeah, like the, the same, like, house cleaning ritual from Maria Menounos, all of like, we all have these, these desires to, to right. yes. Yeah transcend absolutely exactly um so i guess speaking of that so i had a number of questions um I'm, i'll probably combine some of them about the since the one that we read for class was the the article that you did on the hallow app the catholic mm -hmm. meditation app um and some well first of all someone was curious to say do you use the hallow app yourself or anything similar to it in your own life i do i do actually use the hallow app um it's I kind of use it intermittently. It's blowing up. I mean, like they have like Mark Wahlberg is on there now. Um, really? Okay. Yes. Mark Wahlberg is on there. So is um, a celebrity AC Slater. For millennial students. You don't. Yeah. Well, I was, I was going to say it's going to get weird. It's going to get more insidery. Yeah. AC Slater from Stay by the Bell. Uh, Mario Lopez. Oh Mario Lopez Mario is on Lopez. there reading the Christmas story for kids. That's sweet. Yeah. Yes. It is very sweet. It is very sweet. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so I do use Hallow. I'm a big fan of mindfulness, um, just in, in any context. And it's been so fascinating to see through the tent, which is this multi-faith project that we have going on at Tablet, where we have four wisdom traditions, four religious traditions, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, which all have overlapping holidays in March and April. Mm -hmm this year. And so we thought we would bring them all together under one big tent and we would invite participants to come in and hear them give talks on how to pray, how to fight, how to love and how to forgive. Um, and oh, then, cool. yeah. yeah. And then um, within that, they could request one-on-ones because the idea is if you're a spiritual seeker or someone who grew up in a religious faith, um, but aren't comfortable for whatever reason, going to a physical brick and mortar like house of worship, you have this access. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea is, you know, if you're Muslim, but you've never fasted for Ramadan, if you want to host a Seder, but you don't know where to start, like we'll hook you up and, and get that started for you. And so to find out about different meditation traditions, and again, just how much mindfulness, you know, I keep using the word wisdom tradition, but I really think that that's because you know, for all of the critiques leveled against organized religion, there is also a lot of wisdom there that we've kind of rediscovered through other disciplines, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's one of the things that that I think really, uh, I, I appreciated so much about that, the article on Hallow, right? To show that, um, that even for those who are disaffiliated, that, that the, the, the natural desires as we're talking about to connect and transcend, that that's something that 
these wisdom traditions have to share that there's something mm -hmm. you can plug into. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I have I have a couple of questions too that I'm going to combine a few student questions again. Yeah. Um, that but since you focus on this sort of the the growth of the nuns or the spiritual not religious uh, demographic among young people, um, and so many of your articles sort of touch on religious disaffiliation. Um, is that what? What are some things that that have struck you in in your in in talking to to the religiously disaffiliated, or or the, um, is, is there anything that you didn't know about that sort of demographic that you feel like you you have a better sense of now after after the research you've done? I mean, in a sense, we kind of all know the religiously disaffiliated, right? I mean, I that's sort of like. Yep the water that we all swim in, the air that we all breathe, you know, I think what's really struck out to me, though, is just how hungry people are for this kind of thing and how they don't really seem to care where it comes from. Right. Um, and being the age that I am, I came of age during the like new atheists where you had like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and Dawkins is still around, but I don't feel like he has the like cachet that he had in the early aughts. And um, I, it felt like, well, people are just hostile to religion. Like, it's not cool to be religious anymore. Religion is a poison. Like, that's just where people are coming from. And I feel like the tide has shifted. And the more people that you talk to who are just really, like, again, they're not like, oh, well, that religion is bigoted or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, they'll, they'll hear you out on some of the things that you can get out of it. And I think, right. it's because, I think because fewer people are growing up in religious faith, they don't don't have as much baggage associated with them necessarily mm -hmm. um and certainly there are stereotypes out there and there are still like you know every every faith has its issues and you know but in general people don't come with as many preconceived notions and so they are more willing to hear you out on like your meditation tradition or whatever um and so that's been really interesting and again just the way when you tell people you write about religion how instantly they want to know more um right. Yeah, again, which you I'm sure encounter all the time as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you do still sometimes get the 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 hostile response, which is also okay and understandable. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. yeah, but absolutely. I think there is an, an interest, a curiosity and a and a a hunger for the kinds of practices that maybe aren't necessarily affiliated with a particular religious tradition, but mm -hmm. um, but speaks to the desires that those traditions uh, respond to. So um, yeah. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, it's sort of what we were saying, but I, I had a, a number of, I had a couple of questions also sort of asking, do you see apps like Hallow um, becoming like a new norm in, a, in like a generation or two? Or do you see, uh, do you see this making a, a like, like a sort of foundation or par like a paradigm shift within traditional religious practice? Or do you think this is just like a trend for now? You know, it's so hard, hard to say I'm like sure, but... that, you know, I will say for me, it has. I will say for me, you know, a really personal example is, um, you know, when when Russia invaded Ukraine and I, I was I woke up and I was so anxious and I was like, but I knew where to go, you know, like because I have a faith tradition and I have practices that mm -hmm. I believe in. Um, you know, I went and I said my rosary and I, I have my prayers that I recite. And then I went to the Hello app because the Hello app has litanies for um for anxiety oh, yeah. and so like a lot of it is like writing um and so they'll just kind of recite those slowly Teresa of Avila has one like let nothing frighten you let nothing disturb you all things are passing and they'll just kind of say that and then um in a secular context I have mindfulness practices as well so to have the how app playing but then also to do my mindfulness of like just narrating to myself what I'm doing I'm picking up this plate I'm putting it in the dishwasher things like that just the way it grounds you and I could just I felt like okay I can't control what's going on out there I can control whether or not my kids get breakfast and go out the door and go to school this morning you know and just kind of getting me where I needed to be so I mean for me personally and for Catholics we have the liturgy of the hours where you pray the psalms at certain times throughout the day and I have a podcast that I use for that like um, it's just, I can just turn it on if I'm driving my car or cleaning my house or working out. And, um, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that to go away. Right. Like, so personally for me, I, I, and I can't think that I'm the only one, again, you look at the way Hallow has blown up and certainly it's not the only religious meditation app out there either. No. So, yeah. 
Yeah, well, it certainly makes thing, makes uh, even traditional religious practices a lot more accessible and a lot more affordable, right? That you don't have to yeah. go out and buy the Liturgy of the Hours books, which are kind of expensive. And yeah, yeah kind of. Able to, right. So traditionally, only priests really did that. And now mm -hmm. it's becoming something that more and more people are able to do because you just download the app on your phone. So and COVID, I think, really accelerated that, too. Like yeah. people are more comfortable inviting the digital space into their like spiritual practices now in a way they maybe didn't used to be. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I want to make sure that I get a few of the because I have other questions that are specific to to different articles that you did. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Yeah, I I think well, I mean, you've already kind of talked about this. I had a, for the a lot of people were interested in dinner with the dead and specifically how you got on that story. Um, and uh, yeah, sort of what's your what? Um, I guess yeah, I think people were just like, oh, cool. Could you talk about about that a little more? <sighs> I honestly don't remember how I got into the, like how I think I just wanted to, like, I think it was something that I thought we should look into. I think originally I had just wanted to do, when we started the grant, the idea was to do more explainery kind of pieces where it would just be like things you may not know about like the origins of Halloween or whatever. And then um, I really don't remember how the Salem thing I think it was just, it might've just been one of my weird, like, what if, uh, like, not weird in the sense that, like, they're weird, but weird in the sense that, like, I just assumed there must be something going on at Salem at Halloween time and looked into it and said that one, you know, I, I think, I yeah. can't, I honestly can't remember, but I think that was it. And then a lot of it is just a matter of kind of cold calling, cold emailing folks and putting media inquiry in the subject heading from my work email. And again, because I think, I don't think it's true in every aspect of journalism, but I think in the case of religion specifically, mm -hmm. so much of it relies on telling a story, even in non-proselytizing faith. So much of it revolves around telling a story, people who have something that they believe works, that they're eager to share with other people. Um, so like nine times out of 10, it's very rare not to hear back from somebody who's willing to, you know, because people want to be heard, you know, and when you're talking about, and again, in many cases, your core of who you are, yeah. people are happy to, people to talk to you, are happy to talk to you, you know, so I think in some cases, it's just a matter of emailing or calling and saying, hey, I'm a religion writer, and if they're religious themselves, if they're like clergy or what have you, usually, um, and that's the other nice thing about writing religion is um, usually people are very nice. <laughs> <laughs> At least, you know, surface level, very polite, very, you know, so yeah. there's that. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it was a very, it's a very cool article. Um, so it's I have another fun. one. I had a number of students also want to hear a little bit more about your article on the Christian scientist and the COVID vaccine. So I have here uh, a question saying, in your article, Christian scientists consider the COVID-19 vaccine. You discuss the misconceptions regarding the Christian science stance on the vaccine. Um, and so for not all of my students have read this article, but, you know, Christian science traditionally doesn't um, it, it, it traditionally says that, you know, physical ailments can be healed through prayer, right? So that, um, that there, there might be a misconception there, right? That people, uh, that they would be against the vaccine as a result of that. Um, and then, uh, sorry, the question continues. Though an exemption exists for this community, many have chosen to get the vaccine regardless of this. How do you think other religious groups could learn from this open-minded individual um, autonomous approach? Yeah. Yeah. I would say for the Christian scientists, if for them, it's, it's still rooted in their beliefs. Like, mm -hmm. I think they, it is open-minded of them for sure, but it's also based on their religious belief that it, it doesn't affect them, you know? And so it becomes harder, I think, in other faiths when it, you're called to make kind of a, a concession on something that's like a deeply held belief that you have. Um, certainly there are more interesting cases, I think with Christian science, science about like medical care for kids, you know, where the parents' rights come in and that kind of thing. Like that's, I think, where Christian science comes up against sometimes, again, not always, right. but can come up against um, kind of more what one might be expected to do versus what um, they feel comfortable or what their beliefs will allow them to do. And certainly there are like cases that you can read up on if you if you care to search into that. But, um, you know, in this particular case, I think it has a lot more to do with the fact that it just 
doesn't right doesn't come up against their beliefs really well, and, and great, I, think, I mean the art the article is a great example of what you've talked about of, of addressing the misconceptions that people might have mm -hmm. I mean if people know about Christian science at all the thing that they would know is oh they just pray away sickness which of course is mm -hmm. not actually an accurate assessment of, of a really complex and um really layered tradition um mm -hmm. and so yeah to be able to use this and say well let me talk to people who actually are part of of this movement and to hear how they describe um, how they're relating to their, you know, their bodies in the midst of this pandemic. I, yeah, I think that's a great example of what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like true religious literacy, where it's just like, right. this is what's going on. And yeah, you can talk to pretty much anybody and say, I'm writing about Christian scientists and vaccines. And they'll be like, I didn't think they got back. Like nine times out of 10, that's the answer people are going to give you. So that was like a true religious literacy piece, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the last the last uh, selection of uh, questions that I think I have here. Oh, uh, wait. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, I think that's the last sort of collection of questions I have here relate to your your article about um, uh, priests in uniform, where you talk about the shortage of, mm -hmm. of Catholic clergy. Um, and so we're we're almost done here. So uh, but so this is sort of the last thing I, I wonder, too, I, one of the reasons I wanted to end with this is I know that this is maybe an example, too, where um, I imagine that probably some personal experience of, of I know that your husband uh, is not Catholic, but members who are in the armed services that you're related to are. Um, so that uh, what was there, a, you know, sort of personal uh, concerns going into writing that article? I mean, uh, 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 have you experienced this priest shortage or is this something that was drawing you into writing that or was that um, was it just something you had heard about and wanted to write about? I mean, uh, kind of, yes, right, yes. Um, but like our priest at uh, in Kansas, he was a one man show and during COVID, I mean, that poor man, he was saying like, he was saying like two masses back to back. It was basically like, you know, he had like a matinee performance and then like an, a later one that he would do um, every Sunday because of capacity restrictions and so, it was just like the same people doing the same thing over and over again. And he was all by himself. There was nobody to cover down for him. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think I'm really passionate about writing about the military in a faith context, because right. one thing that I think is very cool about the military chaplaincy is that no matter what faith you are, you all have to work together. Right. And so it's like a little reformation that happens every Sunday in a military chapel because the Catholic mass will finish up. They'll close up all the stations of the cross. They'll turn the crucifix around. They'll turn around Mary and St. Joseph. And then it's time for the Protestant service. Yeah. And the Protestant service, yeah. um, if it's non-denominational, is just anybody who doesn't have, like mostly any Protestant denomination that doesn't have a chaplain on post, they'll just all go in there together. and. Um, yeah. And, you know, the chapel that I, that we most recently went to, the military chapel, like we have Good Friday and we have the um, Stations of the Cross up there, but we also have a memorial for the um, Jewish community there. So there's all these Hebrew letters and, uh, you know, Jewish names up on the altar there for, yeah. the, for the Jewish congregation. And we, when we did the tent, this multi-faith initiative, I said, we need to get some army chaplains, some military chaplains on this because they absolutely understand one of the chaplains had this great phrase, if I can't um, perform, I'll provide. So he was a Muslim chaplain, but he said, if I have a soldier coming up to me who needs something from like another religious faith, it's my job to find him the chaplain that can do that for him. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and the other Muslim chaplain, we got two army Muslim chaplains, US army Muslim chaplains. And the other one that we had, he used to teach at the chaplain school. And he said, I used to get up in front of all these chaplains from all different faiths. And I used to say, look, I know that there are people in this room who think I'm going to hell. I know that. I know that. He's like, um, and all I ask for you is that you respect that I'm an adult who makes my own decisions yeah. <laughs> and we, and we all have to work together. And yeah. I, your I mean, I could, and I could definitely see that. Yeah. That approach of just sort of multi-faith respect and, and, you know, sort of learning from different cultures going into your own writing can definitely see how that's coming from this context. All right, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to let these students go, but thank okay, you so much. Of course. Really and I'll see you again in a little bit here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Marjorie. Bye, guys. Yeah. Thank you.